Oh, thank you. Thanks, Shona. Thank you. And thank you for um, inviting me today and thank you to Auckland Libraries. So, um, yeah, that's, there's been a, um, the centenary has sparked an interest in, in World War I research of family history. Um, I started my journey uh, five years ago, not because of uh, the centenary, but it, it, uh, just something I wanted to do. I was driven to do it for uh, reasons I can't explain. Um, I've, my mother's family were from the UK and my father's family fr were from New Zealand. So I was able to experience researching in, in both countries, which, which was very interesting. And uh, so I had two main challenges when I decided to, to start writing a book about World War I, which was that I had no idea how to write a book and I didn't know anything about World War I. I didn't even do history at high school, so I was really starting from scratch. Um, so it all started um, with these four men. The one in the middle, his name is, is Fritz. He, he was my grandfather's father and he survived the war. But his three brothers, um, Clifford is on the left and Max is in the pilot's uniform and Cyril is sitting there on the right hand side. Um, the, the, the three of them both died. So um, what, what I wanted to find out was not so much how they died, I wanted to find out how they lived, what their lives were like, what did they do before they died. I didn't want them to be forgotten forever. And it, um, so I'm going to start um, by explaining the three general areas that I used to research where they were and what they were doing. And you're welcome to take notes, um, but also if you leave me your email address, I'm happy to, to send you a link to the slideshow because um, there, there are quite a few um, helpful website addresses um, throughout the, the um, presentation. Um, and I'm going to explain how I drilled down into each of the, the three general areas for each Cole brother. And I will also do the same for my father's father, who was the New Zealander that um, he um, went to Europe to. So, and at the end I will finish up with how to share your research. You of course don't need to write a book. There's a lot of organisations actively seeking uh, your family stories. So I started, this is what I started off with. I started off with half a dozen medals that had never been worn. So they belonged to the, the three brothers that died, Max, Cyril and Clifford. And when I opened the boxes, those were the medals inside. And you can see one was a British War Medal and uh, there's the victory medal on the right hand side. So on the edge of each medal was, was inscribed their names. So this was Clifford's medal here and so I did what anyone does in this day and age and I just um, put, put Clifford's name into Google and it didn't take me too long to, to find the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website which is uh, an incredible website. It's um, got an awful lot of information on there and as you can see, um, I was able to see, this is Clifford's page, I was able to see his rank, the date he died, how old he was, he was only 20, uh, what regiment he was in and where he was buried. Now Cole is a very common name, so I was fortunate that the additional information was there, son of Mr and Mrs WH Cole. So I was able to, to assure myself that I had the correct Cole brothers. Um, just because it's such a common name and certainly um, the, those parents' names were on the three, the three brothers' records there. So the three main areas that I found were useful was family history, which is oral and written history, which I'll go further into later, official records and experts and enthusiasts. So first up was um, the oral history. I started with, um, as I said, half a dozen medals and not much else. So I emailed everybody in my family, even family members I didn't know very well, um, and told them what I was doing. Told them I was going to write a book about the three uncles who had died, and, and, and then they would forward it to other family members who I didn't know, and people rummaged around their cupboards and, and, and found a few uh, letters and things and photographs. Most of them couldn't help me because they were from the other branch of the family, but um, everybody wished me well, which of course uh, helped me enormously. And the other, the other place that helped me enormously was Marlborough College, which is where the um, four boys all went to high school. And they um, have 
quite an extensive roll of honour and a, a lot of and they sent me a lot of information on, on the brothers and their time at school there. So official records uh, include the National Archives, um, official military records such as war diaries, um, museums, and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, of course, and newspapers. I've got a funny story to tell you about newspapers later on. Um, so now I knew from the Commonwealth um, War Graves Commission website which museum to approach. So I, um, I was able to approach them and they were very helpful. Uh, the National Archives, I hopped on the website. Now the National Archives site is huge in the UK um, for obvious reasons, there's so many people. And I was able to, this is in my very early days of research, and I found that I could purchase the medal cards um, for each brother detailing what their, what their medals were. So I was very excited, I got my credit card out and I paid um, uh, some money and they emailed me through these medal cards and I was ever so excited and then I, of course I eventually found out I could have got them for free at my local library <laughs> on, in Auckland. But, you know, I mean, it's, it is a miracle that I could do that, isn't it? You know, that I could just go onto a computer and, and, and contact England like that and they would just, just email them through to me. So, and this, of course, is the Gloucesters um, website. It's a screenshot of their website and they were incredibly helpful to me. They, what, what they did for me was um, they have, they ha I could have gone in there and got a lot of the information, but uh, I paid a fee and I thought this was quite a, a good value. It was about 20 quid, I think, and I, and I emailed them the money and they went through and found every reference to each individual brother and put them together in one document and emailed it back to me. So they did that for, they said they would do up to an hour of research um, for, the, for the 20 quid or whatever it was. And, but I suspect they did a bit more than that because they could see what I was trying to do. Um, so that, that was incredibly helpful for me. I mean, I could have gone there and sifted through all those, those piles of paper, but it, it certainly was worthwhile having an expert help me in that, in that situation. So experts and enthusiasts, this is my fav fav favourite category. Um, we, when I started, I didn't know anything about mili military terms, like uh, if my uncle was a captain, I didn't really know what a captain was. I, I, I'm just not from a military family and, and I didn't know anything. So I started out, I thought, well, I'll just go to the library and order a whole lot of books. So I, I did do that. And, but I started off in the adult section of the library and it was, I got a bit overwhelmed very quickly. A lot of the books had assumed I already knew a lot. And so what I did was I went to the children's and teens section and started there. And that was a much, much better way for me to go. Uh, because I, I knew so little, I was able to really start from scratch there, which that then gave me a really good basis. Then I, then I could move on to the adults' books um, and, and be a bit more prepared for, for their content, although I was never, really, um, never really got to grips with some of the graphic photographs that were in the adults' books. Personally, I prefer uh, words written by people that were there. Oh, there's some amazing historians, as we all know. Um, but I, I did love uh, looking through the secondhand bookshops and, and the library um, certainly has extensive um, uh, books written and articles by people that were actually there at the time. And poetry was also a, a very good way to find out where the heads were, what was going on in, in their minds and, and, and how, what were their day-to-day -day lives like. I um, also registered with Ancestry.com. There was a, a, a handwritten family tree that my granddad had done in the 1970s, so I was able to key that into Ancestry.com and build, um, build the tree much bigger fr from there. And I, at, at that point in time, it was worth my while. I paid um, a subscription fee to Ancestry.com and I was because I was on it every single day. Uh, th these days, I don't need to do that. Um, I'm not on it every day, so I go to the local library where I'm able to access Ancestry.com for free. So Fritz Cole. So Fritz was my grandfather's father. I had the, and these were some of the things that came through after I'd sent the email to the family. There was a, there were some letters uh, that he sent from the front to the, the woman who was to eventually become my great-grandmother. So uh, I took it upon myself to try and match up what was happening in the letters to 
the official records that I'd, I'd got from the museums and the National Archives. There was also a box of papers that I knew were at Canberra. I had a very vague memory when I was a teenager of my grandfather dropping some papers to do with his grandfather at Canberra. I, um, and I paid an arm and a leg to get copies of them. At the time I could have said to my granddad, can I have those papers? And he just would have given them to me, but I didn't ask, so, but that was okay. They, I, I knew where they were and they were safe and, and they sent me copies of them. And I was lucky enough that a, a gentleman in, in Fritz's regiment uh, wrote a book. Um, he wrote a diary, his name was Henry Buckle, and recently, in the last few years, uh, the Gloucester Museum, they have published that diary in the form of a book uh, with, some, with some wonderful illustrations. So yeah, those, my, so you can see the family history, official records and experts and enthusiasts. So I've got from, something from each of those three areas. Clifford and Cyril I've done together because they were in the same regiment. We, I was lucky enough to visit Marlborough College. They, I went there during the summer break and, and the historian, they have a, a historian that works there and is in charge of their archives. And he first of all emailed me through the education records, um, what they'd been good at at school. We knew, worked out Cyril was the brainy one of the family. They also were able to give us formal pho photographs of them, which was really great. We had uh, photographs of three of them, but uh, Clifford here, who's on the left, we hadn't seen, I hadn't seen a photo of him. So thanks to Marlborough College, uh, I, I now had a photo of them. And there's also uh, Marlborough College built the Memorial Hall after the war. So it's, uh, and every soldier who attended the school that died in the war ha has their name etched into the uh, side, interior side of the curved wall. And there was also a book written um, about the, the battalion that was there that was published in the 1930s and it had since been um, reprinted. So I was able to read that. And again, that was written by someone that was there. So I was able to, I felt like I could get um, a, an, an idea of, of what was going on with, with them. And this is a screenshot from the University of Glasgow. All this information was, was on there before I even wrote the book. They've added to it since the book. I'm using uh, information from my book. So it's, um, but I was amazed at how much was on there before I'd even started. And, and the University of Glasgow also had a photo of Cyril, the same photograph that Marlborough College had had. Now, newspapers. Yeah, I had a bit of a problem with, with newspapers. There was a, there was a big, there's a big famous daily newspaper, which I won't name, in the UK, and I tried to get, I tried to register on there. I did my credit card, and I'd found the article I wanted to purchase. I, you know, I was on, on their website, and it wouldn't let me register, and I, and I had a real problem. It said that my um, a surname, Blackman, was an invalid word and it had been blocked by their spam filter because it was offensive. And so <laughs> I, was, I was a bit um, cross and so I emailed them back and, and I said, look, you know, come on. I emailed them a whole lot of famous Blackmans and said, come on, I'm a real person and can you please override your spam filter for me? And they said no, they, they couldn't do it, and um, they said they suggested I use a false name. Well, I could have, but I was on my high horse by now and a bit cross, and I didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to get those articles I badly wanted. But that was about this time that I attended uh, the second of the two workshops I went to with Shona Lewis. She visited Waheke, where I live, and, and did a workshop at the local library. And I found out that I could get all these newspapers for free. So. I could put away my spam filter, I put away my credit card and not bother with their spam filter anymore. And I was able to just um, access lots and lots of uh, British newspapers through my local library. So I was very grateful to that. Thank you, Shona. And Maxwell. Now Maxwell's, Maxwell I was able to find out the most about and he was the one I was most interested in. I found his story the most heartbreaking, uh, partly because of, of his tender age. Um, I managed to, I was lucky enough to get his officer's file. Now, officer's files in the UK are really problematic. What happened in World War II 
was that one of the buildings that was bombed and destroyed was a building that housed the um, officers' records from World War I. So there are very few of those records are available to the public obvious, for obvious reasons. So, but, but Max's was one of the files that um, I was able to access and the other three brothers I, I never did, could access the officer's file. Um, I, would, I, I had a choice, I could go to visit the UK and look at his file for free or um, I could pay money and, and they scanned it for me which is what I ended up doing. They scanned it and put it on a CD and, e and sent it to me. So I've got his whole file on CD. Um, my mother, very lovely mother, she um, visited the UK and she visited the National Archives at Kew and accessed the One Squadron records. He was a pilot and and so we were able to sort of put, put those two records together and, and find out part of Max's story. And I also contacted the Royal Air Force and they sent me a whole lot of information on Max and they didn't charge me, which surprised me. I thought they would and I would have been happy to pay, but they just sent me out this information. So, and this is the National Archives page fr from the um, British National Archives and that's Max's page. So it wasn't that easy to find. There's so many, so many records, but once I worked, got the hang of it, it I managed to, um, it's, it's easier to work through the system there. And so he, here are my sort of three areas with Max. So Twice Vertical was a really interesting book by, by Michael Shaw and Twice Vertical referred to, uh, at the point that it was written, there'd been two wars and so one squadron had, had been up in the air twice on major occasions. There was only a couple of pages that referred to the short amount of time Max was in France but there was an excerpt there from a diary by a gentleman called Stuart Keith Jopp and I thought if I could get my hands on that diary I would be able to get a bigger picture of what life, day to day life was like for Max and, and the other pilots in the squadron. So eventually what I did was I stumbled across this site. Now Phil Stevenson Payne is not a well known person and he isn't even a particularly um, person who's into history or in fact World War One. but he absolutely loves indexing magazines and he spent an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort indexing magazines from all around the world on all different kinds of topics. So I was able to drill down and find that two of the pilots from that squadron had written short stories in these books, these journals that came out once a month called Great War Adventures. So I, I got a couple of copies off eBay, they weren't cheap, they're, in, they're rare because people are, look after look for them, not just for their content, but the cover art is considered to be uh, a sought after. And I was lucky enough to find a full transcript of Keith Jopp's diary um, again in Canberra at the Australian War Memorial Museum. So I, I emailed them when I published my book. I wanted to include quite a long excerpt from, from his diary and I contacted the Australian Mu War Memorial Museum and, and asked them for permission, as I did for all the other um, places I got permission from, but they, they said they couldn't give me permission, only Keith Jopp's family could give permission. Um, I believe that that diary should be published in full, so if anybody knows someone by the name Keith Jopp, uh, convince them to get that diary published because I really think it, it would, it's a wonderful read uh, and a great educational resource. Um, I'll go very quickly over um, what happened when the day Max was killed. I wanted to find out the different points of view of what happened. So I had the official point of view from, from the National Archives and the um, Royal Flying Corps communique. I found um, the day he was killed, there were uh, five pilots went out, two were killed and one was taken prisoner. And, but because of Keith Jopp's diary, I had the point of view of somebody who was at the squadron and I was lucky enough to find a, the Cross and Cockade, who are a, an, an organisation that, um, they're, they're the First World War Aviation Historical Society, and they put it, also put out a weekly journal, and I was able to find an article about Fullard, who was another pilot that day, and he ended up being one of the highest scoring aces of World War I. This plane here made me feel quite sad, 
This is Lindsay Drummond's plane. He was the other pilot that died the day Max was killed. And I found this on the aerodrome, which is a forum for, it's a discussion board. So people go on, this gentleman's gone on and said, I found this photo, does anybody know anything about it? And under there was a big long list of all these people that knew all about this photo. And it was then that I realised they were talking about the same incident in which my uncle had been killed. So they're, they're, um, these aren't professional historians, they don't get paid, but that all their spare time they just love World War I history and they, they know an awful lot about it. Uh, a, a very, very wonderful and personalised resource there. So yeah, so I'll, yeah, so and these other resources too, Drummond, I found out a lot about him because the Royal Military College of Canada published a book called The Stone Frigate. Again, someone had gone to the effort after the war and every single one of their boys that had died, they wrote about them in a little book. So through all those sources, I felt like I was able to get a point of view, different points of view of that, of that incident. And I'll finish up with, with my father's side of the family. This is Thomas Blackman. He's my father's father. He was very active in World War II, uh, had lots of adventures, and in fact, um, he was made a major for life, but he refused to use the title uh, as he was not in favour of war. The family, in fact, didn't even know he'd had anything to do with World War I. Um, one of the other thing I wanted to point out that's very, very important, this photo here was taken on his wedding day in 1929. Now, there would have been photos of him younger than that. Um, unfortunately, in 1970, there was a house fire and um, thankfully nobody was hurt, but many precious papers and photographs uh, were destroyed. So it's a reminder to all of us in this day and age, we can all back up onto the cloud, back up at someone else's house, back up all your research data, back up, back up, back up, because once it's gone, it's gone forever. But you know, you don't want all your research to, to somehow be destroyed in a computer accident or, or a fire or something similar. So I, the f first was official records. I found the Cenotaph da database. This um, is slightly out of date. Um, the, the site these da this days is, is bigger and flasher and you can actually add, add to it, um, as those of you who know that have been to the previous <laughs> workshop. Um, there's a lot of information on there. The main piece of information I found was he was on the vessel Tahiti. He, he left very late in the war, July 1918. As we know, the war finished in November, so he wasn't there for very long. But there was enough information on there for me to be able to dig a whole lot further into it. So I was able to find his army file on Archway, the New Zealand National Archives site. And it didn't take me long to Google and find a picture of the Tahiti, which was the ship that he went over on. Uh, we can see here that he, he trained at Lark Hill and Brockton and but he never actually made it to the Western Front because the war finished before he, he got there. He was an interesting um, man, my, my grandfather. He, he grew up in the Brethren Church, and although he was close to his family when he left the Brethren Church as a young man, shortly around the time that he went to World War I, he, he didn't see much of them after that. Um, on the trip over on the Tahiti, they had a bit of an awful time. I found out from Otago University that 90% of them caught Spanish influenza on the way over. So it was a very horrific trip. But that was still all kind of, the information I had was all very uh, sanitised. I, I still didn't have anything to find out what, what were the men thinking, what were they going through. And, and I did find that there was a, a publication called The Fag End, an unofficial journal of the 40th reinforcement NZEF. And it was about the journey over on the Tahiti. Well, of course, the word unofficial got me interested straight away. Anything unofficial, you know, I, you know, I can get some interesting stuff there and it was in fact full of anecdotes, poetry, stories and artwork uh, during the journey on the Tahiti. And that's the cover there. I initially saw a hard copy at the Sir George Gay Grey room next door and found his name in a list at the back so I knew it was the right, I had the right group of people. Um, I, much to my uh, delight I have found that since then there's a PDF of the whole, the whole publication available on the Auckland Museum website for free that anyone can download. And I'd recommend downloading it. It's really quite interesting and a few humorous things in there too. 
Um, it's inevitable that with this much information, particularly with official records, that there's going to be mistakes from time to time. Here we can see um, Max was 18 when he was killed, um, and, but here's his gravestone. I've been to his, his grave, uh, his, the cemetery where he's buried in Belgium, and it says 19, but in fact he was 18. And I've contacted them about that error, and they've requested a copy of his birth certificate, which I've sent, so they, they can correct that. Um, so yeah, so, so the official records are great, but there's just going to be the odd mistake from time to time with, with that much information. I realised towards the end that I needed a specialist editor for two reasons. Um, there were still some gaps in my military knowledge, particularly um, with regards to the, the Air Force, and also there are cultural differences between New Zealand and, and Britain. So I realised I wanted to find a British editor that knew about um, British things that could help me. So I found a publishing house near to where the family were in Stroud, and, and I, I sent them off the manuscript and they sent it back, and I've never seen so much red pen in all my life. <laughs> Uh, and four A4 pages of the things I needed to change and, and adapt. So I duly did all of that. And my, my wonderful friends, uh, Paul and Paula Dashwood, uh, they had designed the cover and for me. And they, they corresponded directly with the publisher and copied me into their emails. And uh, that really was like another world. I didn't understand a word of what they were saying. I had no idea there was, there was that much involved in, in writing and publishing a book. It was a whole different uh, language, but a, a very uh, steep learning curve for me, that's for sure. So with the World War I commemorations, there are a lot, lots of organisations seeking information. You don't have to write a book, of course. There's the New Zealand Online Cenotaph. Um, this is the British Imperial War Museum. Uh, they're doing a, sim a similar project where they want people to uh, input referenced uh, records of their own family members. So this is Brian Cole. I've started a page for him, and you can see here that I've uploaded three, three records for him, his marriage certificate, his service records, and an image of his medal card. So I guess eventually I'll, I'll put his photo on there too and, and some other things. So there's, there's several sites like that where they, they are actively seeking your information. I, I wrapped in my family to do an awful lot of work. Um, in, 2012, four of us went to France and Belgium and visited the graves, and also, as I've previously mentioned, uh, visited the school where they went to school. Um, I've already mentioned how my mother went to the National Archives in Kew and, and spent hours in the, in the basement there, sifting through different bits of paper. Uh, my daughter took her, um, some, some French translation that needed doing to school and also sifted through the bottom of the Auckland Uni Law Library to find an obscure case, Cole and Cole, which um, was it sounds like a coal was arguing with another coal, but it was actually asking the court to clarify employment rights for young soldiers that had been to war and then returned again. How entitled were they to, to their jobs back? Um, and my, my son Thomas has helped me with the graphic design, and my husband built this fabulous model of Max's plane. Uh, we'd, I've never seen a photo of Max's plane. I've asked and asked, um, Cross and Cockade and the Royal Air Force and and, and other, other people that know about uh, military history, but uh, I've never been able to find a photo of his plane. So I'm very grateful to my husband for building that for me. And, and another marvellous part of the journey has been reconnecting with extended family and even meeting new extended family that I'd never met before. And, and that's been a really wonderful part of the journey. So these are all the, the people, well, there's actually many more people than this that have helped me. These are some of the people and organisations that have helped me. And yes, yeah, so today I've covered the three main areas I found helpful, family history, official records and experts and enthusiasts, um, and how I've used those sources to research the four Cole brothers and Tom Blackman. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you've got, um, but if you think of a question later, please just email me. I'm ha happy to, to uh, um, answer anything if, if you think of something later. Um, and thank you to Auckland Libraries for inviting me today. Thank you.